I invite you, whether you're online with us or in person today, if you have a Bible, to turn with me to the book of Job. I'm going to invite those of you who are with us today to remain seated. I want to read a fairly lengthy portion of the opening of the book of Job. I'm going to start at chapter 1, verse 1, and read actually all the way through the 10th verse of the second chapter. A man in the land of Uts was named Job. That man was honest, a person of absolute integrity. He feared God and avoided evil. He had seven sons and three daughters and owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 pairs of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a vast number of servants. So he was greater than all the people of the East. Each of his sons hosted a feast in his own house on his birthday. They invited their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of the feast had been completed, Job would send word and purify his children. Getting up early in the morning, he prepared entirely burned offerings for each one of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned and then cursed God in their hearts. Job did this regularly, as do we all. Um, (laughs) One day, the divine beings came to present themselves before the Lord and the adversary also came among them. The Lord said to the adversary, where did you come from? The adversary answered, answered the Lord from wandering throughout the earth. The Lord said to the adversary, have you thought about my servant Job? Surely there's no one like him on earth, a man who's honest, who is of absolute integrity, who reveres God and avoids evil. The adversary answered the Lord, "Mm, does Job revere God for nothing? I mean, haven't you fenced him in his house and all he has and blessed the work of his hands so that his possessions extend throughout the earth? But stretch out your hand and strike all he has. He will certainly curse you to your face. The Lord said to the adversary, look, all he has is within your power. Only don't stretch out your hand against him. So the adversary left the Lord's presence. One day, Job's sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. A messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby when Sabaeans took them and killed the young men with swords. I alone escaped to tell you. While the messenger was speaking, another arrived and said, a raging fire fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and devoured the young men. I alone escaped to tell you. And while this messenger was speaking, another arrived and said, Chaldeans set up three companies, raided the camels and took them, killing the young men with swords. I alone escaped to tell you. And while this messenger was speaking, another arrived and said your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house when a strong wind came from the desert and struck the four corners of the house it fell upon the young people and they died I alone escaped to tell you Job arose tore his clothes shaved his head fell to the ground and worshiped He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will return there. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken. Bless the Lord's name. In all this, Job didn't sin or blame God. One day, the divine beings came to present themselves before the Lord. The adversary also came among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to the adversary, where have you come from? The adversary answered the Lord from wandering throughout the earth. The Lord said to the adversary, have you thought about my servant Job? For there's no one like him on earth, a man who's honest, who is of absolute integrity, who reveres God and avoids evil. He still holds on to his integrity, even though you incited me to ruin him for no reason. The adversary responded to the Lord, well, skin for skin, people will give up everything they have in exchange for their lives. But stretch out your hand and strike his bones and flesh. Then he will definitely curse you to your face. The Lord answered the adversary, there he is. Within your power, only preserve his life. The adversary departed from the Lord's presence and struck Job with severe sores from the sole of his foot to the top of his head. Job took a piece of broken pottery to scratch himself and sat down on a mound of ashes Job's wife said to him, are you still clinging to your integrity? Curse God and die. Job said to her, you're talking like a foolish woman. We, will we receive good things from God, but not also receive bad? And even in all this, Job didn't sin with his lips. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I, I love to tell the story. In fact, I'm quite sure I've probably told it to you before that uh, when my sister and I were little, um, I think I was probably about seven or eight years old. My sister would have been three or four. We had moved uh, to Phoenix, Arizona. My mom and dad were pastoring uh, a church in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we lived in this lovely parsonage that the church owned. Uh, but it was a little bigger house, and I, my sister and I were getting to the age where my parents thought, it's time for them to learn to do some chores and help around the house. And so they created a system. We, we took old milk cartons, and we decorated them, turned them into banks of a kind. And then we had these uh, red, white, and blue chips that we called Courtney's. Now in adulthood, I know they were poker chips, mom. Uh, it's a miracle I'm still Christian. But, um, but we created this system and we had poster boards and we, we created the system where the, I believe the blue chips were worth a nickel and that was kind of for easy stuff. If we made our bed in the morning before we went to school, we got the blue chip. Or if we made sure all of our clothes were in the laundry basket, we would get a blue chip. The red chips were worth a dime. I had to do a little bit bigger stuff here. I think I first learned to try to kind of help mom vacuum the house or I don't know why we had a bird. Somebody gave it to us, but we had a bird for a while. And so if he cleaned out the bird cage, that was worth a red, red, uh, chip. Um, Courtney. But because my parents are my parents, the white chips were worth a quarter and there was only one thing you could do to earn a white chip. And that was for every verse of scripture we memorized, we got a white chip. Now, of course, I was only seven or eight years old, but not an idiot. Who wants to slave labor away for nickels and dimes when the big money's in the scripture, right? So like, uh, so I truly, this is a true story. I spent the first week and I memorized the first four chapters of Proverbs. <laughs> now, uh, this morning in early service, one of the Jorgensen kids came up afterwards and said, do you know you cost your parents $27.25? I was like, yeah, totally, uh, totally. Yes, I do know that. And it ended the contest. Um, <laughs> And I, I still remember a few of those verses from Proverbs, but I especially remember the verse that my sister learned. Uh, my sister was, you know, couldn't read. She was only three or four at the time. But my mom taught her that first week a verse from, from Psalm 56, verse 9, out of the Living Bible. And by the way, I looked it up this week and realized it's actually not the whole verse. It's only the latter half of the verse. But I'm sure she got the whole quarter. <laughs> I'm still working through this in therapy, but, um, <laughs> but the half verse that she learned goes like this. This one thing I know, God is for me. And I, I remember it because the way that my parents uh, taught us to learn scripture, we would repeat words back and forth. And so my mom would say this, and my sister would say one, and this one thing I know. And then she knew the end of it. She would say, God is for me, right? And she would do this when she would say, God is for me. That is such an important truth. And if you know nothing else about what we have gathered to celebrate this morning, know this, this one thing I know, God is for you. God is for you. So we are 17 books of the way through this journey, um, through the scripture. We've We've gone from Genesis through Esther. And I think I can summarize the essential message of those 17 books in this way. That God desires more than anything for the entire creation to live at Shalom, to live in Shalom and peace and well-being with God, the creator. To live in Shalom and peace and well-being with each other as images and reflections of who this God is. To live in shalom and peace with the creation and even to live in shalom or peace with who God has created us to be as individuals. This one thing I know, God is for us. And God is working to restore the shalom that God intended for the creation. And because of that, I, I know this, these 17 books have taught us that God hates, 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 hates. When we take the goodness, the giftedness, the, the freedom that God has given to, that, to us, and we use that to, to abuse, misuse, 
to hold others in bondage that keep them from being able to live fully into the image of God that God formed them to be. And when we find ourselves on the other side of that abuse and misuse and bondage, when we cry out to God, we know this. This one thing we know, God is for us. God hears our cries. And God can make a way where there seems to be no way because God is for you. Amen? And because of that, we also know not only does God hate when those things happen, but it breaks God's heart when we allow our own sin and idolatry to not only hurt and damage others, but to cause ourselves to fall short of the hopes and dreams that God has for us. And it breaks his heart when we allow sin to mean that we become less than what God created us to be. But God is for us. And if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and teach us how to live lives of holiness and goodness. For this one thing I know, God is for you. Amen. If we choose life, God gives life. If we choose death, death comes as a consequence. God is not mocked. People reap what they sow. This is the heart of the Torah. This is the heart of these 17 books. This is the heart of what the scripture calls wisdom. And I believe it, and it's true. But wait a minute. There once was a man from Uts whose name was Job. Ah, book 18. Book 18, the book of Job complicates things just a bit. Because what happens when the righteous suffer? And what do we do when the system that we call wisdom the system of merits and punishments, of doing good and receiving good and doing bad and receiving bad, what happens when all of that seems to break down? So when I came up with the idea of, of trying to go through the Bible this year, the biggest problem for me was this. It was... When do we start so that when we get to Lent, we aren't in terrible texts like Chronicles? Where will we be as we journey beneath the cross? And, and I have to say, part of the reason we started in, in October was so that we'd get to spend a couple of weeks in Job when we got to Lent. And so I, I want to say this morning, if you're a guest with us this morning, you have to come back next week because this is a two-parter. We get to spend a couple of weeks in Job, and, and next week we're going to get to the deeper questions, I think, of Job, which are the questions of suffering, and, and we'll think about that not only in the light of Job, but in the light of the cross. And so next week we'll do what, what Pastor Diana, Pastor Brent, in their wonderful book, The Backside of the Cross, wrestle with, and that is, are there any answers at all? Or how do we think about who God is and who we are in the light of suffering? And how do we narrate that? But we're going to talk more about that next week. But we, before we get to wrestling with that suffering, this morning I, I want to think about Job as a book that causes us to, for lack of a better term, to grow up just a little bit. And to be forced to wrestle not just with Sometimes the oversimplicity of that theology that I just articulated a little while ago. But also to open ourselves up to the possibility that God works in ways that are actually even deeper and more mysterious than the simplicity of our formulas. So, I, in order to think about the book of Job this morning, I have to talk just a little bit about what the book of Job is. And so forgive me, I have to give just a brief lecture on, on genre, on what kind of literature is the book of Job. Because it is a unique 
book, and it is a unique form of literature. As probably most of you know, we, we have a Bible, we think of it as one book, but the problem is there's 66 books that comprise that one book, and those books aren't all the same kind of literature. We have sayings like Proverbs or songs like Psalms, or we have historical books like some of the ones we've been through, First and Second Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, etc. But then we have this section that we call the wisdom literature. And the wisdom literature probably functions a bit different than some of those other books. And I would argue Job certainly does. Uh, and by the way, I just can't recommend highly enough to you um, our friend Dr. Wendell Bowes, who just recently passed away, his commentary that he poured himself into for the Beacon Bible Commentary series on Job is a work of art. It is, it is beautiful and profound. And if you have more questions about this, I encourage you to, to get a hold of it and to wrestle with, um, with that great work. But in it, Wendell argues that the book of Job, as you look at it, really doesn't read like history at all. In fact, you don't have to be a great biblical scholar to figure this one out. It kind of opens like a story. In fact, the first line is basically this. Once upon a time, <laughs> there once was a man from, and by the way, according to Wendell, it's pronounced Oots. Um, there once was a man from Oots whose name was Job. And then, as we get into the later chapters, the bulk of the book is actually speeches that Job gives or that his friends give to Job. And so it's all kind of poetry, which I don't know if how your life operates, but there isn't a lot of poetry that happens in our household, right? We don't speak to each other that way. I love Pastor Ryan to go to, to musicals and, you know, you see this wonderful demonstration, for example, like Hamilton. We know that, you know, these characters existed, but we're pretty sure when Hamilton got off the boat, he didn't start breaking into, I'm not throwing away my shot, right? Like there's an imagination there that says, how do we, if we were to put this story in poetic form, how would that happen? And certainly Job is a drama in that way. In fact, you could take the book of Job and drop it into a very modern screenwriting um, program on your computer and it would drop right in. Uh, it's written like a play. And the reason why that's important is it may be the case that there was a man from Uts whose name was Job for whom, on, about whom this book is based. But my guess is that that's probably not even the case. That a wisdom writer sat down to think about a guy from a far off place named Job who did something it's almost unimaginable to think of any human person doing. He lived a life of full integrity and faithfulness to God no matter what happened. And Job then becomes this ideal, this aspirational character that we look at and that the wisdom writer then can hold up to say, we know this about Job. Job was righteous. But not all of Job's life worked out. So here's how the book of Job opens. It's fascinating how the play kind of opens up. It opens on Job in the land of Uts, and everything is perfect. In fact, when you read the text, everything adds up to 10. He has seven sons, three daughters. He's got 500 of this animal, 500 of that one, 700 of this, seven, or 7,000 and 3,000. Like everything adds up to 10. Woohoo! Everything is perfect. Life is good. He is faithful to God and God has blessed him so much so that he is the greatest person in the world. Then we move over to the heavenly court. And another reason why I think it's important to understand the kind of literature that Job is is because if we're not careful, we can read this part of the story and get into some really weird places theologically. In fact, there are unfortunately some traditions in our world that I think read this text poorly and get into some weird places theologically because of it. But the writer wants us to imagine that God is in the heavenly courts and some of the heavenly beings are there with God talking about what's going on on earth and this particular being that's called the adversary who is not, by the way, in the text of Job, a bad character, but actually kind of a good one that is there to make sure, kind of, you know how some of you have hired a personal trainer and they're wonderful, but you hate their guts? <laughs> and, and you pay them for you to hate them, right? Like, 
the adversary is this wonderful person who's making sure that our faith is real. And so the adversary says, well, I know, God, that you love this guy, Job, over here, who seems so faithful, but I have been thinking. The reason he's so faithful is you blessed him so much. My working theory is if you took away all of the good stuff you've given to him, he would go from blessing to curses. What do you say? And God says, eh, let's give it a shot. You can't hurt him, but take away everything he has. Again, be careful because of the kind of literature this is. I don't think God makes these kinds of deals over our lives. In fact, let me say it this way. I know that God is for us. But in the story, sure. So we go back to Job. And we have this powerful series of, un a series of really unfortunate events. Messenger after messenger comes and says, hey, Job, bad news. All the camels were stolen, but I, <laughs> I remain. The next one, bad news, Job. All of the herds were killed, <laughs> but I survived to tell the story. The next one, bad news, Job. All the crops have been burned away, but I survived. And then the last one, seriously, bad news, Job. All of your children died. Job, in just a few verses, has gone from the sort of pinnacle of life down into the depths, right? But here's what's crazy. We sing this chorus every once in a while. Job says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Back into the heavenly courts. The adversary is like, oh, that didn't really work very well. I got this idea. If you mess with his health, if you make him hurt a little bit, I mean, I get, you know, circumstances are circumstances, but if you mess with his health a little bit, then he'll curse you right to your face. And God grants permission. And so we go back, and now Job is sitting in a pile of ashes, inflicted with a curse straight out of the book of Exodus boils all over his body from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, scratching himself with broken pottery. It's gotten so bad now that even the closest person to him, his wife, comes and says, now, Job, you're going to keep your integrity now? You're a mess. Curse God and die. To which Job's response is, that doesn't seem consistent with what the wisdom tradition teaches us. Should we receive good things from the hand of God, but not also receive the difficult? And even there, the text says Job did not sin. Hmm. Now, come back next week. Job, who seems <laughs> so stoic in some ways, that is actually not the theme of the book that we should all learn to be stoic and receive the circumstances of our lives with a straight face. Not get too high, not get too low. Because when we come back next week, Job has had it. And Job, who's singing lovely praise choruses in chapters one and two, now is ticked off at God, wants God to show up so that they, he can have a trial with God. And at moments says, you know who I really hate today? God. So come back next week. But the next chapters then launch into conversations with Job's three, and we'll use some air quotes here, friends. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And what's important for this morning in this text is that what they embody over and over, they, they each speak three times in the text, and Job responds to each of them. But what each of them embodies is that they know, they, they learned when they were in their high chair, this one thing I know, God is for me. And if you do good things, you get good things. And if you do bad things, you get bad things. That's how it works, Job. Clearly then, you're getting bad things, so therefore, you've done bad things, Job. And Job keeps saying, I, I promise I haven't. And if God would show up, I think God would tell you this. But I, I, I promise I haven't. And I'm ticked off at what's going on in my life. But I'm, 
I, I promise you it's not because of sin that these consequences have come, but they can't get there. No, certainly. And in fact, the more Job denies it, the more it's clear to them, oh, you are a sinner and it's going to get worse for you, Job. And the problem, again, as we'll see next week, is these three friends who want to lecture Job on how Job needs to respond. What they really need to do is get down and sit in the ashes with Job, but they can't get there. And so instead they preach and they lecture to Job, which only makes Job's problems worse and his pain more severe and his depression more deep. Are you with me? And so what Job begins to open up for us, and please be with me here, it doesn't invalidate the last 17 books of the Bible that we've just read that have said, listen, there is a pattern and grain to the universe. God will enact justice on those who oppress others. If you do good, good will come. If you sin, consequences come. That is so true. However, there is a, a bit more to the story than that. And it's not, and here's, here's the hard part this morning, so lean in just a little bit. It's not just that life is more complicated than that, which it is. But it's that in the mystery, as we'll see next week, of who God turns out to be, it is not just that life is more complicated than that, but there's also a mystery in our lives and in God's activity in the world that somehow is related to this suffering that is more complicated than this simple math equation. The places where we begin to get at that, even in those first 17 books, there's a mysterious story. It's very troublesome to me. But in the book of Genesis, we have this guy, Abraham, who, by the way, lives into that math a bit. When Abraham is faithful, really good things come his way, but when he tries to give his wife away, bad things happen, right? Like he's challenged. He is, not, he is the role model of faith in some ways, but not the role model of faith in a lot of ways. He struggles to even live into that kind of equation, but towards the end of the story, Abraham's faithfulness to God actually pays off in the blessing of an unexpected child of laughter named Isaac. But then the strangest thing happens. In the 22nd chapter of Genesis, God says to Abraham, go take Isaac to Moriah and sacrifice him there. Between you and me, it's one of the strangest, darkest, most mysterious, oddest chapters in all of the scripture. Scholars throughout the ages have wrestled with the complexity of it. But somewhere in the midst of that mystery is this, that Abraham has gotten to a place in his relationship with God where enough trust has developed that he can do something that seems so illogical and odd. He can take this promise that he has lived a long obedience in the same direction to finally receive. And he can go to Moriah and essentially say this to God, I trust you enough now to give this promise back to you and I have no idea if I'll ever get it back, but I am willing to offer it to you because I now trust you more than I trust the promise that you've given me. Did you get that? Between you and me, I have no comprehension of that. And I know I'm your pastor, but I have very little embodiment of that in my own life. It's, it's an aspiration. It's held out for us as the place where we might actually get to a place of maturity where we could walk with God with that kind of closeness that Abraham had. Certainly, again, we'll see it more in this interesting literary figure, Job. But we see it just a couple of other places. We have hints of it in the book of Isaiah. During the Lenten season, there are a whole bunch of texts from Isaiah that show up in the lectionary. 
they're texts usually related to what are called the suffering servant texts. And, and what's going on in those texts is this, that the prophets are looking at the things that have happened to Israel and realizing, oh, look at what happened. When we were faithful, God blessed us, but when we were unfaithful, we ended up in exile. Because that's the math of the universe. But now God has given us grace, and if we walk with him, now new life will come back to us. But in the midst of that, the prophets begin to wonder, is that the sum total, though, of what has happened? And, and I know this is really heady, so lean in with me. The prophets begin to think, you know, even when we were in exile and suffering, there was more going on there than just punishment for our disobedience. God was there. And somehow, and I, between you and me, it says the prophets are scratching their heads and they're going, I don't, I don't know how to talk about this, so I'm just going to put it in poetry. Somehow, this people that we have become have been wounded for our transgressions, and yet, somehow in the midst of those stripes, healing not just of our own lives, but healing of the whole creation has begun to take place. Are, are you with me? Then we get to the Gospels. And we get to what, between you and me, may be the most important text in the last few years of my life. The centerpiece of the book of Mark. There's this miracle there that I love. I've talked about it a lot. It's, it's partly my favorite because it's the only miracle Jesus didn't get right the first time. He encounters a blind man and he touches him and he says, can you see? And the guy says, well, uh, yeah, kind of, but I see people, but they look like trees walking around. And so Jesus kind of spits in his eyes and says, can you see again? And he goes, yeah, now I can fully see. The very next story is that wonderful one where Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they say, oh, Lord, we're so glad you asked that question. It has been so clear to us in all of these eight chapters of Mark in Galilee, the Spirit of God is upon you. You're able to make lame people dance. You are able to make the mute sing. You're able to make the blind see. You're able to fill multitudes with just a sack lunch. I mean, it is clear the authority, the power of God is upon you. And so much so that some people think you're Elijah. Some people think you're one of the prophets. Some people think you're John the Baptist. Come back from the dead. But the great question, but who do you say that I am? Peter gets the right answer. You know, you're the Messiah the anointed one. But then, and this is the very important but in the text, but then Jesus begins to describe how this anointed one must suffer, be rejected, experience the shameful death of crucifixion, and on the third day rise again. This, by the way, makes no sense to Eliphaz, Bildad, or Zophar, and it makes no sense to Peter. No, you understand, you're Messiah. Here's how this works. You've come to do powerful good things, and good things will happen. You can't do these faithful things, and bad things occur. To which Jesus' response is, get behind me, accuser. For you're still thinking like Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, like humans think. There is a divineness that is going on in the world that doesn't do away with that equation of the first 17 books of the Bible, but is much deeper that enters into suffering. that begins to transform the world by entering into that Amen. and transforming it for the sake of all creation. Amen. Of course, the disciples are like that blind man who see just well enough to know the right answer but don't quite see well enough yet to know the deepest mystery of what it means for Jesus to say this, if you wanna be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. For if you truly want to find life, you'll lose your life for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom. This is why this is important this morning. 
I so want you, if you know nothing else about what you've walked into today, know this, this one thing I know, God is for you. And there is deep truth to this. If you will offer God your life and follow the purposes God has for you, blessing will come out of that. Life will come out of that. And if you continue to walk down patterns of brokenness, consequences will come. That is absolutely true. But most of you in this room, it's time to grow up a bit. And not just recognize that life's a little more complicated than that. But to begin to understand that actually there is a mystery to the way God operates in the world that is able to take even the most difficult, broken things of our lives that we cannot fully explain and to begin to bring redemption out of them, life out of them, newness out of them. And here's the problem. If we don't get there, then two things are going to happen. Your faith will always be dependent upon your circumstances. And when someone asks you, how are you and God doing, you'll first look at your checkbook. Or you'll take your relationship pulse. Or it won't be March in Nampa. It will be summertime. (laughs) And the days will be long and you'll say, we're doing great. Because you will never break out of the immature habit of equating your walk with God with the circumstances you're experiencing. But even more importantly, if we are not able to get to that place, we will always be Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And I know, please hear me when I say this, I know the majority of you in this room, not all of you, but the majority of you in this room have been around long enough and you're smart enough not to say really stupid things about people who are suffering in the world. You know you're not supposed to say, well, those people who are there and have no place to go or those people who are so desperate or those people who are so oppressed, you know better than to say God isn't cursing them. But here's the thing. Somewhere deep in our imaginations, we still look at them and say, yeah, but they must have really done something to get to deserve that. Because if we didn't think like that, we would get down in the dirt with them. But instead, like Job's friends, it becomes far easier for us to embrace the comfort of our circumstances and preach at those in need. And where Job wants to get us, the book wants to get us, is to get us to that place where the reason people are suffering no longer matters as much as the fact that they are suffering. And we then can be drawn not to give them cliches or simplistic answers. And I don't want to ruin next week, but to be an instrument of the very divine presence in suffering that Job will later experience. And that's why we come around this table today. Because when we come around this table, we are actually eating a mystery. In fact, I know a lot of you are C.S. Lewis fans. There's this wonderful line in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Where towards the end of the book, Aslan says to the four children, you know, the witch, she understood some of the deep magic of the world. She understood the calculation. If you, this is my translation. She understood the calculation. Now she used it to her advantage, but she understood the math. But what she didn't understand is there's actually a deeper magic at work that explains why Aslan giving up himself for the sake of Narnia changes everything. And why we gather around a cross to proclaim that the one who seemed abandoned by God is actually the redemptive presence of God in the world. And so we come around a table to say what looked 
like utter brokenness and despair and abandonment, broken body and shed blood is actually the very mystery of God's redemptive life in the world. And we're not here just to kind of lecture on it and go home, but we're here to take it into ourselves so that somehow that mystery would become part of who we are. And we could learn to not just allow our lives to be equated with our circumstances, but that we could too could take up the cross and be present with all of the Jobs who've been abandoned. And be present in the places where in the mystery of God, something deeper than just pain is taking place. God, help us today. That's such a hard text. That's why it took 17 books to get there. You are inviting us, oh, into the deep end of faith. There is no question today in my mind that you are for us and that you invite us to live into patterns that bring beauty. There's no question in my mind how much you deeply hate patterns of abuse and brokenness and do not want people to be submitted to that. And you call us to justice, to liberation, to freedom. I know it breaks your heart when we sin and I know that you are faithful and just to forgive us. But there is an, a deeper reality even still that you invite us into. To receive from your hand what you have to give us, but to also take up our cross. Forgive us today for all of the ways the church has looked to the world like Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. People whose lips rattle, but whose lives are far from those in need. And so make us what we eat today. Make us the body of Christ present in the sufferings of the world so that redemption might come. For we pray this in Christ's name, amen. I'm gonna invite those who are helping to serve today to come. Um, if you're new with us, we take this meal together. If you would just hold on to the elements, we will take this meal together. And, and there is no church membership necessary uh, to participate only a sense that we need the grace that God is extending to us today.
Would you hold the elements out in front of you? Let me pray a prayer of blessing. Creator God, we hold in our hands very common things, common bread and common cup. But this morning we recognize within them a deep mystery of grace. A grace that meets us in our places of brokenness. A grace that doesn't allow that to have the final word, but a grace that brings transformation through it. And so I pray for some today who come with all kinds of brokenness. Would you help them to discern this morning what is the consequence of things that need to be confessed and a grace that needs to be received as opposed to the things of life that because you are present draws us actually closer to you and closer to those who are also suffering. So make us what we eat today, make us a reflection of that mystery. The night that Christ was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he raised it, gave thanks and broke it. Said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Let us take and eat this morning in remembrance of him. When supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it, said, this is my blood poured out for you to preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Let us take and drink in remembrance of him. May it be so. May we be the body of Christ for the sake of the world. And God's people said, amen. I, I would love for us, as we close this morning, to sing the last verse of that song that we just were singing. The words go like this. And so with thankfulness and faith, we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. And here's the line. As we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of the king. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's proclaim that deep mystery today. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond. to remember our call to follow.
sing this with me, just our voices together. Oh, how he loves, oh, I gotta get in the right key. Give me, help me out. B flat. Oh, how he loves you and me. What? <laughs> Come on, Faith. You gotta be ready for these things. There, tell me. Oh, how, oh, how he loves you and me. figured it out. Let's do it one more time. Oh, how he loves you and me. cross is foolishness to the world. But to those who are being redeemed, it is the mystery of grace, the reality of love, and the hope for transformation. And so may the God who keeps making peace, may he sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit, our souls, and our bodies be kept sound and blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he who called you and loves you, he is faithful, and he will finish his work in us. And all God's people said, amen. Go in his peace.